Congrats for the first of all, thanks to Nick for the kind of invitation to this uh, very interesting meeting. Uh, as announced, I will uh, present uh, the results of uh, about two decades of landscape research into the deflation and also early Holocene in the Skull Basin of northern uh, Belgium. Um, the results I will present are uh, the, the work of a whole team, an interdisciplinary team uh, of uh, different uh, specialists in different uh, fields of research. I've listed their names on this slide. This is the structure of my uh, presentation. After a short introduction, I will uh, briefly uh, give a, a description of the main late landforms. And then I will focus on the methodological aspect, the, the ways we use uh, for mapping late glacial landscape and uh, buried late glacial landscape and sites. And then hopefully I've got some time for discussing the environmental issues and land use. Um, the Scheldt is the second most uh, important river in Belgium after the Meuse. It starts in uh, northern France here, uh, where it uh, runs in northern direction towards the North Sea Basin, where it joins the river, uh, rivers Rhine and uh, Meuse. Um, the upper uh, Scheldt, uh, so the upwards uh, section of the, of the Scheldt, runs through a hilly area this area and uh, once beyond the city of Ghent, uh, we speak about the lower Scheldt basin which runs through a typical sandy lowland uh, area. Uh, there are pretty much uh, sites known from the late glacial. Uh, we've got nothing so far earlier older than the Federmas culture. Uh, we've got two distribution maps here, one for the Faber Massa sites and another one for what we can link to the Young Dryas, uh, Ironburg and Katie Ironburg or something related. And from these distribution maps you can uh, observe or draw two main conclusions. That's first of all, there's a, a serious de decline, uh, decrease in number of sites from the Alloway to the Younger Dryas, and we've got 30 Faber Massa sites against five, six uh, Younger Dryas sites. And secondly, perhaps this is not that clear, there seems to have been a sort of uh, occupational shift from the Alloway to the Younger Dryas, whereas most or nearly all Faber Massa sites are located away from the rivers, away from the Scout and its tributaries, into the sandy interior, and where they are clustered around a series of freshwater lakes, I will present these those later. And if you look at the map of the younger dry sites, uh, you clearly see that these sites are really linked to the flood plains. They are in the flood plain or just along the flood plain. So, in order to um, understand this uh, settlement pattern and land use more in detail, we uh, developed or defined a number of research questions. Uh, the last few years, and one of these research questions is, first of all, how reliable are, are these distribution maps? Uh, to what degree are they affected or biased by positive positional factors? You have to know that most of the sites indicated on these maps are surface sites discovered through field walking. So, it has still a potential to find sealed sites, buried sites. So, that, I think this is a very important uh, research question. And secondly, if the distribution maps are not too highly biased, strongly biased by these factors, how can we explain these uh, uh, settlement patterns? A short introduction uh, about the main late glacial landforms. This is a very simplified map, a geomorphological map of the uh, lower scalp, because the lower scalp is the area where we have been working most. It's only recently that we also extended our search to the upper scalp. Uh, first landform, of course, is the, are the rivers, the river scout and its tributaries, uh, with their uh, wide, broad uh, flood plains, um, which locally extend into uh, uh, large meanders of both. This is one of the largest one. It's about two kilometers long. And within these flood plains, we've got plenty of fossil uh, pilot channels of these rivers, which are uh, sedimentary uh, traps, uh, very important for sampling, for environmental analysis and along these final channels there's uh, numerous um, uh, elevations 
small elevations, mostly sandy elevations, levees, coal bars, and also river dunes, which might have been attractive to late glacial uh, hunter gatherers. If we move away from the rivers, more to the inland, uh, we have a typical cover sand uh, environment with uh, numerous uh, cover sand dunes. And most of these dunes are rather small but elongated, as you can see on this cross section, and small, uh, small but elongated uh, sand dunes. But there's one exception that's a big uh, dune, a large dune, this one which we call the Great Red Ridge of Maldehem Steven, which runs over, this is indicated here in yellow, runs over a total length of 80 kilometers. It's roughly two to three kilometers wide. In fact, it's a dune complex. It's built of intersection and overlapping of uh, different smaller dunes, but locally, this is a massive dune. Uh, a typical feature of all these uh, dunes, smaller and larger dunes, is their parallel orientation here all south uh, uh, east west or southwest northeast oriented and this is mainly due to their formation under dominant western northwestern winds as you can see on these slides uh, on top of these dunes and also in between the, the numerous uh, dunes there are plenty of there were plenty in the glacier, late, late glacier there were plenty of uh, small depressions shallow depressions close depressions uh, probably blowouts, which were wet depressions, because uh, on, at the base of these depressions we find a, a thick, I think 10 to 20 centimeter thick, a strong organic uh, sediments, uh, sometimes even 80 sediments, which uh, clearly indicate that these were uh, temporary wet uh, um, uh, depressions. We call them dune slacks or dune ponds, and there must have been hundreds of these uh, in the late glacial landscape. And as you can see, there is a later on filled with aeolian sands. So they are present in the organic layers within thick packets of cover sands. And then finally, we've got uh, somewhat larger uh, uh, shallow lakes, um, uh, freshwater lakes, uh, like this one, the Mouvard Lake, which is about 25 square kilometers large. And these, these are indicated, indicated in blue on this map, and you can see that they are all situated along the steep southern slope edge of this uh, massive dune mountain statement. And you can see that uh, their infilling is totally different than these dune slacks. They are a typical infilling uh, consisting of calcareous material. So uh, that's a detail of uh, the Mouvard Lake. So um, this is just a picture of uh, Western Siberia. But I think it's good, it gives a good idea of the, the landscape during the Albert and the Lower Scalpies. Good, so uh, in order to understand the human behavior, I think it's very important that we map that these different landforms as detailed as possible. And for that, we invested a lot of time and energy the last two decades in looking for the best practice, the best methodology to map these buried, that buried landscape and also buried uh, sites. And uh, the methods we develop, or the, the methods we use, are dependent on the, the depth of the uh, buried landscape. In shallow landscapes, like uh, the, the freshwater lakes, the Boomerang Lake, and uh, here again, or the shallow fluid plains, we start with uh, manual drillings, that's a standard methodology. But uh, we combine this with LiDAR information. We've got for the whole Flemish territory, We've got uh, high resolution LiDAR information with a resolution of 16 measurements per, per square meter. And this allows us to detect even the smallest uh, topographical, topographical features. And if you look carefully, you can see here and here uh, the old late glacial gullies channels still visible in the landscape through these LiDAR uh, data. And if the budget allows it, we also apply uh, geophysical survey techniques like uh, electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic induction EMI, which is mainly the work of my colleague Philippe Desmet, who's also doing a research uh, service in, in Stonehenge and, and, and Avery. It's a method which measures the electric conductivity of the soil, but also the uh, magnetic properties in 
that in range and that ranges from half meter to three to four meters, depending on the type of sensors you use. And the main advantage of this method is that it's very rapid. If you pull it with a, a quad, uh, you can uh, yeah, survey large areas in, in a short time of period, give you an ID. This is the move out lake, and these light bluish uh, uh, zones have been surveyed by EMA. Yeah. And uh, in lines, parallel lines of separated two to three meters, and within each line, uh, each 20 to 30 centimeters, there was a measurement. So high resolution measurement, and that took uh, for one hectare, one hour. So in one hour, you can survey one hectare. Of course, the problem is that the processing of the data takes quite a long time. <laughs> but the field work is very rapid. So uh, well, that's the detail of, of the mapping. And you can see that uh, with, with this method, you can, you, you are able to uh, track these uh, labelation gullies of channels, which are quite small. It's on big channels, wide channels. So this is the, the result by the combination of these three methods. We uh, were able to reconstruct two uh, different successive river systems, one which we call the anastomizing river system, leading to the Berlin and Alaric, based on C4, a series of C14 days and which was replaced by a single channel uh, river, meandering river, near the end of the alloy. And I think this is crucial information for understanding the human occupation around this uh, lake. I forgot to see now to uh, include a map with the distribution of the feeder mass sites. But there's plenty of feeder mass sites along the northern bank of this uh, lake. Uh, if we have to, meet, to map a deeper uh, uh, landscapes, three to six meters deep or even deeper. Then, of course, uh, manual ordering is not feasible anymore. Uh, if you have to do series of borings, uh, then we move to mechanical uh, borings, grid borings, and uh, we tested out two different methods: the Behemoth boring and the uh, sonic aqualock drill method. And you can compare the results of these two different methods, and you can clearly see that there's a, a difference in quality of these two systems, but there's also a difference in price. Um, this, the, the sonic grill is cheap, it's the cheapest method, but you can see there's many problems with it. You've got compression of the sole, you've got loss of material at the contact of different spits, and most important, you've got the deformation of the original stratigraphy. All these problems are absent in the market, but it's 10 times more expensive. Uh, we also did some testing with uh, the, uh, the mechanical deep trenching or test pitting method which is developed and generally used in France for mainly looking for the early and middle paralytic sites in these deep loose sequences. We applied it on this the massive dune of Mount Hepstake in order to locate and map these dune slags and it was very successful. But there's a series of disadvantages of course, this is a rather expensive. It's dangerous, of course. You can't jump into these pits because it's very dangerous for collapse. So you need to do your sampling at C2. It works. Uh, and also, if there's a site present, it's partly destroyed during the mapping. So it's not that good. And the most important, it's not uh, widely ap applicable because um, it depends on the, the groundwater level. If the groundwater level is too uh, too high, you can't apply this method. And that's the main difference with the dry low sequences in northern France or and elsewhere in France. And so in, in our search for better adapted uh, methods, survey methods, uh, another colleague of mine, Jeroen Verheer, tested out the, the feasibility and applicability of cone penetrating testing, CPT. Um, this is a method which is uh, widely available in building companies because it's used for measuring the stability of the soils for foundations. Uh, so it's cheap, it's widely available, it's really uh, um, applied on a daily basis in these building companies. It's a, a rather simple method, it con consists of a metal rod which is driven into the ground at a constant speed and while penetrating the soil it takes two measurements, one at a tip is the cone resistance and then one along the sleeve which is the friction and the combination of the two measurements allows us to uh, yeah, define 
the texture or dis discriminate between clay, sands and, and peat, which is very important certainly in our area. Uh, to demonstrate this, uh, this is another graph you get from a company who is conducting these CPTs. The left curve is the bone resistance and the uh, right curve is the sleeve friction. And uh, here you've got the results of uh, a cone and a CPT and a coring which were taken at the same spots. And you can see very, very nicely that where sand is hit here in the upper part and lower part of the coring, there's a, a peak in the tip resistance and no sleeve friction. And when a peak is hit, you see the opposite signal. Then you have an increase of the fleece, uh, the fleece, the sleeve friction and no tip resistance. So you can use this information to uh, uh, define the large uh, lithostratigraphical units. For example, if applied in a, in a grid, a fixed grid, you can make transacts like you do for corings. Um, and here you have the definition based on these measurements of different uh, units. So blue is the uh, alluvial, uh, Holocene alluvial clay. Below, in the middle, you've got brown, the Holocene peats, and uh, yellow is the uh, Pleistocene, the Pleistocene copper sands. To our surprise, uh, it also turned out to be possible to um, identify smaller organic layers. These typical small organic bands at the base of these dune slacks, which are within these long sequence of, of carbon sands, they are detectable to a certain degree with these CPTs. I don't know whether it's, it's clear, and I will take another example. The one uh, CPT with the tip resistance to the left and to the right, the C friction, and this is the carbon sand. We did a drilling there, a pouring, and you see that in, within the carbon sand, we've got three superimposed organic layers separated by sand, the oil and sand. And if you look at the deep fr the, the sea friction, you see a very minor tip peak, which perfectly corresponds with that organic layer. This, this is uh, for us a very promising method, which uh, allows us to map these deeply buried um, yeah, dunes, dunes lags over at extens extensive uh, areas for yeah, the cheap price. So this is the advantages, I won't repeat this all, but uh, there are also, like for every method, uh, the disadvantages. One of the main disadvantages is that you have to do some additional corings in order to validate your interpretation of the measurements, but also what the CPT does not provide is information about the quality of the different layers. Are the layers intact or eroded? Is there salt formation process, etc.? And for that, you need extra corings to validate and to interpret the preservation of the soil sequences. But a, a new development, and that's something my uh, colleague Jeroen is, is currently testing, is the application of a mini camera in the CPT, in this metal rod, as you can see here, uh, with a lens of one centimeter, which uh, takes photos every one and a half centimeter while the metal rock is penetrating the soil and these first results are very promising. Here you've got the coring which I just showed with the three uh, superimposed organic layers uh, in the copper sense and if you look at the combined photos taken by that small camera you can see that the all three levels can be recognized through these photos. So this is again according to us very promising methods, which needs to be further tested. I was glad to, uh, uh, yeah. the, after many years of mapping, uh, we come to the conclusion that uh, the lower scale basing, the, the, the landscape during the late days was very dynam dynamic. Um, and uh, we could uh, recognize different uh, aeolian events, events of aeolian erosion and, and deposition. Of course, this is well known. Uh, erosion is mostly uh, correlated with the 
the cold and dry spirits. Uh, we know that during the older and younger dries, this deposition of one to two meters of aeolian sands. So this is, these are two events which might have covered uh, uh, potential late glacial sites. But to our surprise, we also have proof, found proof of aeolian activity during the alerts. The alert, which is normally considered as a very stable uh, period because of the increased vegetation. Uh, one of these uh, elements of proof is, again, it's the same slide, but it's a very important slide, I think, uh, with these three superimposed layers. Each layer uh, was dated uh, by means of C14 dating, and at least the middle and the upper one turned out to be uh, to belong to the alloroid, perhaps the lowest one too, but there you can discuss. But if the middle and the upper one are alloroid, that means that the, the sand in between both has been deposited during the alloroid. The same conclusion can be drawn from this pollen diagram here. That's a pollen diagram. It's, sorry for the bad quality, but it's, it's still in progress. But it's uh, along the northern bank of the, this extensive move lake. We found that specific locations that the lake marl, the calcareous sediments, were uh, uh, covered by aeolian sediments, and according to the embedded pole, these date to the middle alloroid. So we've got, I think, strong proof that there has been aeolian activity in the alloroid too. There's also increasing evidence that most of the river dunes, which were uh, which are present along the, the rivers are dating to the younger dryness. We've started to apply OSL dating on these uh, river dunes, and most of the dates go back to the younger dries. And finally, another process where we need to consider, and which may uh, bias our distribution maps, is collusion, the formation of colluvial layers on top of uh, the inflation size, as here uh, in the upper, uh, upper scalp area, where we found recently found a younger dry site, well preserved, it's one of the best preserved sites we know in Skull Basin, which was sealed by uh, in a colluvial packet of uh, about half a meter. Just to mention, we did similar methodological research in order to find uh, buried sites, deeply buried late glacial, but also uh, early Holocene sites. And I just want to say that it's perfectly feasible to find these sites through coring. It's just a matter of doing it the, the right way, using the, the right grid, the right size of the, the, the course, and the sieving work is, of course, also very important. And the meshes you use, but I can't go deeper. And it's all published, so it's available. And then another aspect of our research, that's the, yeah, the environmental uh, reconstruction of these uh, landforms. Uh, we uh, are increasingly investing into uh, high-resolution multi-proxy analysis of some of these uh, continuous soil archives. And uh, for example, I show you some pictures, diagrams of multi-proxy uh, high-resolution. I mean that we are sampling every two, three centimeters to long sequences, uh, investigating different proxies, not only pollen, but MPPs, Ostracos, uh, Hieronymus, uh, uh, plant remains, uh, stable isotope. Uh, we've investigated two freshwater lakes in this way, the Mufart Lake and a smaller lake in Snellahan, series of uh, dune slacks and a number of fossil uh, power channels of the river scalp and its tributaries. And this combined information allows us today to uh, formulate some hypothesis, hypothesis uh, concerning uh, prehistoric late glacial land use. Uh, what we observe is that towards the end of the alloroids, most of these freshwater uh, reservoirs, so the dune uh, ponds and the freshwater lakes, uh, vanished, dried out. Uh, this is the example of the Moorvart Lake, where you see that we've got sediments starting from the building until the end of the alloroids. But there's a, a, a large depositional gap between the late alloroid and the boreal. There's no signs of erosion, so probably, most likely, the lake dried out at the end of the alloroid start of the younger tracks. Similarly, in the smaller Snellham Lake, 
uh, which is much smaller than the Moorfire. We've got a clear change in sedimentology between the alloids with the deposition of Lake Mall and then during the Younger Dries, uh, the formation of peat, which clearly uh, indicates a change, a hydrological change. This is uh, based on uh, a model of all C14 dates we uh, got from the, these organic layers of dunes slags. And you can clearly see that the dune slags were existing from the building during the entire alloyed, but disappeared during the younger drive. So both the freshwater lakes and these dune slags seem to have dried out, or most of them, and this must have, a, have had a dramatic impact on hunter gatherers and also on the animal population that's killed and killed out. Um, so our hypothesis, hypothesis now is that uh, due to these, uh, this, this important hydrological event, hunter gatherers, which were pretty much focused on these inland uh, freshwater lakes, had to move to other territories. And one of these uh, possible uh, regions where they moved to was uh, the, the, where the rivers, the river valleys, the river food lakes. And that might explain, if you remember the two distribution maps I showed in the, in the, in the, at the start, that, that might explain why we find younger dry sites, preferably along the uh, food plates or into food plates. So that's what I have to say, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> could come up and we'll have a, a few questions um, for our two speakers and then we'll move on to the final uh, discussion section. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Just on the last point, rather than drying out, could the lakes have frozen? Frozen at the... Uh, the they disappeared probably around the end of the hour, so I don't think that's a right timing for when the younger tries everything was yeah, younger, we, we believe it's prior to the start of the younger tries. Oh. Of course, our uh, chronological resolution is not yet that refined to, to really be sure, but you've got the impression that it started a bit later, a bit, a bit earlier, so within the outer period. Possibly it can be linked to an intra outer period cold period, that's also possible, but. Um, We've got no proof of yeah, freezing. There's no indication, no features which can be linked to to uh, or something like that. Your cone Yeah, that's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> no, the one you spoke. Yeah, CBD. What happens if you come to a rock? Yeah, it's it's, it's for it's for <coughs> soft material, so mineral material. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It's no. It's not applicable in, in, in rocky sediments uh, in a rocky environment. So yeah, it's for sand, clay, uh, uh, yeah, peat. So for alluvial context, it's perfect. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I think here in, in Britain there's some areas for it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, uh, the point about raw material and size uh, is actually very well made um, because long bit seven is like that that we use um, very poor quality river flint, but they're still using the, the typical technique that you outlined with the book platform course. And I remember going over to see Jean-Pierre Fagnon Belvoir assemblage when we took out a long blade over and it was about that long and put it next to one of his which is about that long. <laughs> so yeah that, that's right people are still using that sort of technology even though it's difficult to and and I think your point about the variation at that time again is very well made where I think um, within that wider context, there were very, very specific localized adaptations of that technology and toolkit, depending on from river valley to river valley and to different places in the uh, 
uh, landscape depending on the type of prey that the group are following, the group size. So within the broader sort of technical context, there are very specific adaptations uh, which are incredible. And I, I don't know what patents like these days, it's been a long time since I've been in this, but I mean, my feeling was that a lot of the long lay stuff is produced within a very short, relatively short time scale mm -hmm. uh, of very rapid uh, adaptation in the landscape. So I, I really enjoyed the paper. And the other thing is, I'm glad, interestingly, the old question about is it a tent or isn't it a tent, you know, um, <laughs> around the central half, that one's been created you know, a lot of time, you know, do people live amongst all their rubbish within a shelter with a fire, or do they actually have their shelter outside? And the shelter is inside the shelter, it's clean, and, the, and you know, I don't know, it's not cool there, but, but there's a lot of, Okay, thank you very much, and uh, for the team, we, we don't really know, uh, we know it's secular, we, we don't know that the roof, um, we just know it's something secular. What, what is interesting is, um, in Alize, in Normandy, they found a site, a contemporaneous site, a few years ago, and the structures identified with wall effects too, it, it's very similar, it's like five meter, and the verse in the middle, so it's, that's the only thing I can say. And for adaptation of local traditions, you're totally right, and something, it, it, it's very easy, what I would say is very easy, but, uh, if you look at the reindeer, reindeer is present here in England and in the northern country and not in France. So it, it could have influence changes, but it could. I have no idea. You're your study right. Thank you for your comments. Okay, I do have a question related actually to the last point about these structures. I know you don't want to go into lots of detail about the distribution of the prison, but did you have any sense of how, uh, what activities were undertaken within the houses and how the space was organized? Sorry, can you really slow this? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I know you didn't want to go into lots of detail about the distribution of uh, the artifacts within the structures within the houses, but um, did you have any idea of how the space was organized and what activities were undertaken? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, oh, okay. So, in the center around the hearth is mainly uh, project points manufacture, and no, manufacture and reacting. Mainly. Um, we have kind of everything inside. Uh, the problem is it was clean. So all the big artifacts are on the walls. Uh, and which is interesting is uh, ice scrapping, uh, dry ice scrapping activities are mostly outside the structure. Probably because it smells bad. <laughs> but it's, it, I mean, we have, we have ice scrapping inside, but outside we have only ice scrapping activities. Um, what else? Um, I think it's main results. So probably fleet mapping uh, around the earth, um, having a projectile manufacturer projectile around the earth, cleaning, and other activity outside. But inside we are not able to have a good resolution because of this cleaning activity. Okay, I'll bring this part to a close now and thank the speakers, the two speakers. Um, we had uh, for their contribution. Um, so thank you very much indeed.